Hey y'all, it's Neely. We're getting close to our finale for season one, but there's still time to send in your questions or comments to be featured in our next episode. Regardless of if you like us or hate us, we want to hear from you, and we'll be glad to answer any questions about the case that we haven't answered so far. All you have to do is call our voicemail hotline at 256-333-5005. This is an automated voice messaging service, so you won't talk to an actual person. Just tell us your name, where you're from, and your question or comment. If you'd rather send in your question or comment by email, that's fine too. Just send them to skepticalpod at gmail.com. If you want your question or comment to be heard and answered on our next episode, you need to send it in before this Friday. Otherwise, we won't have time to edit the episode and add it in. As usual, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. This series contains adult language and includes content that some listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is strongly advised. From Reckon Recordings, this is Skeptical. I'm your host, Neely Faulkner. This is Season 1, Episode 8, entitled The Wicked Woman. Skeptical is one story told week by week, so if you haven't listened to our episodes in sequential order, go back to episode one and start from the beginning. Last week on Skeptical. Hello. Hey. Hey. Guess what? What? So I found a Ronde. Did you know? that he is in prison for the murder of Jason Posey. Oh my God, are you kidding me? If you're a Christian, chances are you've heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den. The Bible tells the story of Daniel, one of many governors of a kingdom led by King Darius. Daniel was a noble and honest man, but some of the other governors didn't like him. These other governors decided to try to dig up something on Daniel that would take away his favor with the king, but they couldn't find anything. They decided to cook up something, so they conspired together to convince the king to issue a new decree that would make it illegal to pray to any other god than King Darius. The governors lied and told King Darius that all the other leading officials, including Daniel, agreed that the king should do this, so King Darius signed the decree. When Daniel learned the decree had been signed and posted, he continued to pray to God just as he always had done. He went to the upstairs loft of his home with windows overlooking Jerusalem. Three times a day, he knelt there in prayer, thanking and praising God. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying to God just as they knew he would, so they went straight to King Darius and reminded him of the royal decree he had signed. King Darius liked Daniel and tried his best to get Daniel out of the fix he'd put him in, but he finally caved to the conspirators and ordered Daniel be placed in the lion's den as punishment. Daniel was brought and thrown into the lion's den with a stone slab placed over the door. King Darius went back to his palace, distraught over what he had done to his friend. He couldn't eat or sleep all night. At daybreak, King Darius returned to the den and called out anxiously to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve so loyally, saved you from the lions? Daniel replied from inside the den, My God sent his angel, who closed the mouths of the lions so that they would not harm me. I've been found innocent before God and also before you. I've done nothing to harm you. As I read over this story in prayer one morning, I immediately thought of the likeness of Daniel in the Bible to Daniel Bland. It appeared to me, just like Daniel in the Bible, that Daniel Bland had been the victim of a large conspiracy orchestrated by higher members of society that put plainly just didn't like him. However, the evidence I have of this is not rock solid. If anything, it's held together by a thin piece of twine, not supported by much fact, but definitely possible, based on circumstantial hearsay. As I've told you before, 
Almost everyone I've spoken with during this case believes Daniel is innocent. So how is it he could have been convicted of murder with no physical evidence? The answer is like a knot. It's made up of many strings tangled together, and if you manage to break out one string, the others begin to unravel as well. Through many conversations I had with Daniel, Daniel's friends and family, attorneys, and even the Bernas family, I began to unravel the knot to see that maybe Daniel was deemed guilty based on hatred of him by those who should have protected him, his adoptive family. So did you have like... Did you go to, like, Thanksgiving dinners and, like, Christmas and things like that? Yeah, with their Christmas, you know. They got, yeah, they got pictures of me holding the baby and all that. But, I mean, they accepted you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they accepted me. They didn't approve of it at the beginning, but afterwards, yeah, they accepted me. I was at the Christmas dinner. I spent Christmas together. We did Thanksgiving together. Uh, Fourth of July, you know what I'm talking about? I was like Mike's son, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Nah, they probably didn't spoil me like Rock Band's children or Mark's children because I wasn't a natural, but I was the first child of the so called family, you know what I'm talking about? So did Mike, re- did Mike refer to you as his son? Or how did he refer to you yeah. when people asked about you? Huh? His son? I was his son, you know, even though I was a doctor, but I was his son. He kind of got upset with me because I didn't take his last name when I had the opportunity to. Because I didn't know my last name. I thought my last name for a little while was Millicent, but it wasn't his plan. You know, when I found out, I'm like, shoot, I'm going to go by my real name for one. You know what I'm talking about? And I did, and that kind of got him upset. But other than that, yeah, I was, I was his son. Daniel has told me a lot about his childhood. He's told me a lot about Mike, his mom, and his sister, Lisa. He's talked to me about his wife, Christina, their kids, and even a few of his friends in prison. At times, I've wondered if Daniel has ever realized just how bad his childhood actually was. So I asked him about it. I mean, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but you just sometimes when you talk about your childhood, you just talk as if it was the most normal thing. Um... But in reality, you had a rough childhood. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's, that's the past. We can't, we can't live in the past. We can't let that determine who we are. You know what I'm we can't. You know? Everybody had their ups and downs. You know what I'm talking about? And I guess I got a guilt that it blocks stuff out. You know what I'm talking about? It's just... I don't dwell on it. It is what it is. It's gone. You know, I can't do nothing about it. I can't change it. You know what I'm, I'm not going to let it hinder me. You know what I'm talking about? You know, I sit back, think about some stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Like, dang. I don't know what it was like if I let yeah, this every day that happened to me, you know. Was it my biggest mistake by getting adopted? You know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, I try not to focus on the bad. There's enough bad in the world. Why focus on it? Do you... there's, there's always someone. There's always someone in my that has life worse than you have. During my weekly conversations with Daniel, we've spoken extensively about the Bernos family. He's consistently mentioned that Mike's mother Nita wasn't too fond of him. Several of his old friends who had been around Daniel and Nita together also told me the same thing. Daniel says that Mike had told him that in the event of his death, because his family didn't like him, they would fight to keep his belongings from Daniel. Yeah. See, there's a lot I know about that family. There's a lot of, I know about that family. They don't think I know. The reason I know about that family is because what Mike told me about that family. You know, I like said, even though Mike had a picture, right? But he wasn't a lot, he wasn't like me. He told me. He told me that Danny, something that would happen to me, my family's going to fight for everything. They don't want you to have nothing. He told me all that. So how they done with him, about his dad's stuff. So when his dad died, they didn't let him have nothing. They wanted it all. So he gave it all to him. But eventually it came back to him. Um, 
And you, and you show me how they work. Is it Danny? You know, if something ever happens to me, they're going to fight tooth and nail. I said, all right. I said, Mike, I don't want nothing. I said, you know, I really don't. He said, no, you got to ask me because I've been promised to mom all that. I said, I'm cool. I, I really don't. I don't want nothing. So, uh, then, you know, I got to tell him, it's really funny, you know, they found out that he changed, uh, that, uh, he changed his will and testimony back to his mom a month before he had died. But he also told them that me and him was talking. Were they scared of his gonna change it back again? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I see what you're saying. You know, because when they when they first asked him, Daniel, what do you want out of all this? Oh, I want mm. what I give him to my You know, I want the picture I gave him that I painted when I was in high school. I want the uh the mug I gave him for his uh birthday present. I said, that's all I want. I can have the rest. And he didn't get nothing. So I don't want to take that. No, I didn't get none of it. I didn't get a, a thing of it. When I went to the house, they called the sheriff on me. When I was packing everything up, and I pulled up in a Z28, a, a girl that I was dating had, you know what I'm talking about, California, I pulled up in a Z28, 84, no, it was an 80, no, it was 80, 90, 90, 90, I think it was a 90, 90, 93 Z28, you know. When I pulled up in there, they were shot. I stepped up, I was like, hey, what you doing here? I'm going to call the chef to call him. I thought I got as much blood to you as you were. I said, that was my dad. He went in your day. I said, what are you doing? I waited for the sheriff. Got the sheriff came. He said, son, you know, you're not supposed to be out this morning. Because you were, I said, I'm his son. I got much right. Will you please leave, you know, you know, they have a right right now to be here. I thought it too. I had heard this story once before from the anonymous witness I featured in several episodes. He told me that shortly after the murder, Mike's family had been at his home cleaning up the house and gathering his belongings when Daniel showed up. And also, Danny came back. You know how they say that uh, murder always comes back to the scene of the crime? Mm -hmm. So... Danny came back there, and they had come to, you know, start clearing out some things out of Mike's house after a month or so. I don't remember the timing, but they had the doors open and everything, and Danny came up there in his car. And he asked, you know, because went out there and asked, you know, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And he said, I just wanted to walk down to the creek where, and see it where Mike and I used to have talks. The anonymous witness gave me some more information about this encounter with Daniel, but I don't want to play the rest of the audio because it identifies who the witness is and how he's related to the crime. When I first heard the story, I'll admit I was confused as to why Daniel would go to Mike's place. He had admitted to me that he didn't visit Mike's home in Rockford much, so why go back when you know he's not there? Showing up at the house after his death didn't necessarily pin him as guilty, but I guess it was weird. Keep in mind, Daniel didn't learn of the murder until August 3rd, a week after Mike had been killed. So when Daniel visited Mike's house, it was at the same time he learned that he had lost one of the only people who had ever truly cared about him. In one of the first letters I got from Daniel, he mentioned the name of a woman who, at the time, I didn't see as a person of significance to the case. But throughout the investigation, it appears she's played a key role in Daniel's conviction. Her name is Reza Davis, and she's the former Alabama Chief Assistant Attorney General. Davis served as a public service lawyer for over 43 years, serving under eight attorney generals. She began her career as an entry-level law clerk and eventually worked her way to the position of Assistant Attorney General, where she supervised the Criminal Appeals Division. Current Attorney General Steve Marshall has praised Davis's work and noted that during her time in the Criminal Appeals Division, the division, quote, consistently had over 90% of their cases affirmed, even as the caseload increased dramatically. In 1999, she was appointed as the Chief Assistant Attorney General and has since served as Chief Counsel for the Alabama Ethics Commission, the Alabama Sentencing Commission, and Judicial Inquiry Commission. She retired in 2015. 
Rosa Davis is important to this case because according to Daniel and his friends and family, it appears she and fellow attorneys altered information presented to the grand jury in order to get an indictment, among many other alleged items of misconduct. Well, I can almost guarantee you this. If you were one to look at, uh, I know this is probably going to be hard for you because the Alabama law has a sanction of a long time thing that the uh, grand jury indictments are secret because of for whatever reason that they feel they need to be secret for because of the people there. Uh, but I can almost guarantee that if one could look into the grand jury, it would probably show that where the Assistant Attorney General Greg Briggs and Rosa Davis was allowed to mislead the grand jury to believe that they had the murder weapon when they knew that the murder weapon that they were going to present to the grand jury was not the murder weapon. It was the weapon that I was charged with and could stand for all things. And that was misleading. You know what I'm about? Yeah, and uh, they never found the murder weapon, right? They never have no murder. Daniel was right, although I had already noticed this previously. When reading over the grand jury transcripts, I noticed Biggs consistently refers to the murder weapon, knowing no murder weapon had ever been recovered or linked to Daniel. The only time Daniel was ever supposedly linked to a gun was to a 380, which would not have been used in Mike's murder. Well, like I told you, if you can actually look at the transcripts of the grand jury. I truly believe that y'all will see where they use that supposedly gun to convince the grand jury. And if I can prove that, if I can show that, that alone right there is going to get my case overturned because that's this character's justice to the fullest. You cannot present false evidence to a grand jury to bring about a bogus indictment at all. You cannot do that. That's illegal. All the way around the board. Yeah, I get what you're saying now. Now that makes sense to... If, if, if you're attorney general, okay, if you're the law, okay, and you know, you got... Your, your expert witness in 94 said this, this gun is not going to kill Mr. Bernal, okay? But that gun you present to the grand jury as a murder weapon, saying, hey, this is the weapon that killed him, and you already know him, this ain't it, but you tell them it is to convince them to get an indictment, no, you just step, you just step go off, you just step crowd, go boundaries. And what you're doing is illegal to the fullest. You, you can't do that. You can't. That's your law. Um, and yes, I kind of get upset about that. <laughs> well, I mean, you have every right. <laughs> this wasn't the only thing Greg Biggs alluded to during the grand jury proceedings. I noticed he had also consistently mentioned Daniel's name right before or after Tony's, then immediately asked the witness if he or she is aware that Tony's a drug dealer, in what appeared to me as an attempt to connect the two of them through a psychological phenomenon referred to as the illusion of validity. This happens when someone observes data and makes predictions or conclusions about the data based on patterns that they saw with the goal of making sense of their observations. For example, during the grand jury proceedings, Greg Biggs asks William Price if he knows Daniel Bland and refers to Daniel as the coach's son. Price says no, he doesn't know him, but he does know of him. Biggs then asks Price if he knows Tony Quince. Price says yeah, he knows Tony and has known him his entire life. Biggs asks Price how he knows of Daniel, yada yada, and if he knows that Tony Quince sells drugs. In each of the transcripts from witness statements completed during the grand jury testimony, Biggs does the same thing asking the witness if he or she knows Daniel, knows Tony, and knows if Tony sells drugs. Subconsciously, the jury is connecting Daniel with Tony and assuming Daniel bought drugs from Tony, making sense of the patterns from the data they had just observed. The illusion of validity disrupts our ability to make accurate predictions because the data has been influenced, or in this case, alluded to. Was Biggs playing dirty? Well, yeah. But was what he did illegal? Probably not. I guess you have to applaud the man for understanding the human mind and how to manipulate it. After all, that's how he makes his money, right? I want to talk about how big of a part Bobby Casper, the private detective hired by the Bernas family, played, if any, in Daniel's conviction. 
it appeared to me that without her, Daniel would never have been considered a suspect and would never have been linked to Tony. The Bernas family decided to bring Bobby Casper into the case after leads on the killer had fallen short and the case essentially went cold. She came, she accepted the case. I think she was a, had previously had some FBI experience or something. But anyway, she accepted the case and she went kind of like, I guess you'd say undercover. So in her first few days in Clanton, you know, she pretty much had the pieces all put together that the ABI had kind of dropped the ball. So Danny, they became, I guess you'd say, friends. So Danny never really had that mother, mothering kind of thing. So he latched on to Bobby like, almost like she was his mother. Right. And so he was in jail in Clanton. She went to visit him. And, of course, he was, you know, thinking, you know, it's his mother coming to see him, like, you know. Mm -hmm. So when she was talking to him about the murder, of course, he would say, you know, he'd say he didn't do it. But he said, if... I was going to do it. This is how I would do it. And he drew a picture of Mike inside of Mike's house because, you know, Danny had been there several times. And he said, so then I would come from this room back here down the hall and then the hallway comes into the living room, because it was all open living room, dining room, kitchen. You know, when you first go in the house, you're in the living room. Right. If you come in the house from the back door, the French door, you come in, you would come right into the dining room, but it was still all open with the living room, dining room, and kitchen. So the hallway, if you walk from the living room towards the kitchen, the hallway would go to your left. And they had three bedrooms. So the furthest bedroom on the right was Mike's bedroom. And the and then there was two bedrooms on the left. You know, as you're coming down the hall, there's one bedroom. And you go down a little further, and there's the second bedroom on the left. And there was also a bathroom in the hallway on the right. And then there was, of course, the master bathroom off of Mike's bedroom. So basically what I remember him and I think Bobby had the drawing. You know, she yeah, I've the seen drawing. the drawing. Okay, mm -hmm. so you know about that. Then, you know, because how would anybody, I mean, people that are guilty of things like this, from what I understand, they, in their mind, they like to relive the crime. And so he drew it out showing exactly how he would have done it. This drawing was one of the first documents and evidence I had seen during one of my visits to the Coosa County Courthouse. At the time, I didn't realize the significance of the drawing, so I later went back and got a photo of it. The drawing is small and only measures a few inches on the page. It's obviously a bird's eye view of the inside of Mike's home, and the witness says there are dots drawn in coming up the hallway. Like Casper, I too began to connect the dots, no pun intended, to think maybe this was how Daniel had committed the crime, hiding in a back room and ambushing Mike as he sat in his recliner. When I spoke to the Bernas family, they suggested I contact Bobby. I tried, several times actually, until eventually she blocked my number. She also ignored several letters I had written. I was hoping to ask her if she would let me grab a copy of her recorded conversations with Daniel in jail, over six hours of audio. The Bernas family also suggested I call Rosa Davis, which I thought was odd since she wasn't the prosecuting attorney, but I didn't have any luck there either. She never responded to several messages I had left or letters I sent. You know what I'm talking about? What she probably did was call uh, Rosa Davis, and Rosa Davis advised her to say, look, you know, I talked to them folks, if God, if he gets any kind of support or anything like that, he'll get out of prison. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Because when I was in West Jefferson, when I had Doyle, and I was in that honor dorm, right, and I was going back to court on Route 32 and stuff like that, 
a man talked to me, Steve Longnecker. He had a man come in from a news article, right? And just all they said was, hey, an innocent man in prison. And that's it. Basically, what we said in the article, right? That woman got so hysterical, moved me from West Jefferson all the way down to Holden. Hmm. You talking about Rosa had a part in that? Yeah. So I didn't have, I didn't have, I didn't get no trouble at West Jefferson. None whatsoever. I was in our dorm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There was no need for me to be moved. And I'm pretty sure I'll probably get moved from home. But guess what? I can only go to one another prison. That's St. Clair. Every time Daniel told me a story about Rosa Davis, I was hesitant to believe it. I felt like many of his stories were just speculation, especially when he told me that Rosa Davis knowingly withheld evidence by way of Greg Biggs that Michael Bernas was a child molester, a vital piece of evidence that would have allowed the introduction of a possibility of an alternative motive and suspects. Well, tell me when the last time you talked to Sarah Hamlet is. Oh, back in 19... Was it 2001... I think 2001. So why did you quit talking? Okay, me and her, we got to talking, right? And she was getting a lot of stress out because I was, I was relying on her a lot. You were what? Yeah. Relying on her for source of income. Because she told me if I ever need anything to ask, and I started asking. I got out of my character, and I started asking her for a lot of you know, I'm like, hey, I need this, hey, I need that. And I, so we supposed to get married. And, uh, but my mom shot that. But, uh, so I got to ask her, and she got a little frustrated about that. She said, the only thing, only thing you're doing is using me. Why does that look like I can hold? Uh huh. Uh huh. Then she started, started talking to me about, well, I've done this, I'm going to lose this for my family because I went up against, I can start hold up. I can first of all, Talking to you, phone. I said, first of all, I told you that I didn't want to see you without anything. I didn't want to put you against your family. You decided to do this. I said, so the best thing you want to do is take some time away from each other and we think of everything. I said, but uh, I can stay in contact with you because of your children and stuff like that. So, you know, her two kids, Morgan and Robbie, they call me dad, you know. And... I, I took that to heart. And so I wanted to make sure I, you know, I was there for him. But she left, she left. That was it. She went her way. And you hadn't talked to her since? Nope. Have you tried to reach out to her? I don't even know how to find her. Well, I think I found an address for her, so I'm going to write her because I've called a couple of times and I I just, I have like a hundred, like literally like 15 numbers for her and some of them were disconnected and some of them just went to voicemail, you know, and so I wasn't sure if I got the right one, but if it went to a voicemail, I left one. Um, so I'm going to write a letter this week and see if I can find her. I can't find her on Facebook. I've tried and... I mean, I'd really like to talk to her. I think that she could give a lot of insight, you know. I mentioned Sarah Hamlet in an earlier episode, but to refresh your memory, she's the niece of Rosa Davis. She and Daniel had been friends since Mike got custody of Daniel, and over the years they remained friends, but a romantic relationship later evolved. Daniel told me they had plans to marry, but for some reason it never happened. They broke up, dated other people, and a few years later, Daniel went on trial for Mike's murder. After Daniel's conviction, Sarah approached Daniel and convinced him to drop his pro bono attorney, Dole Fuller, to hire a new attorney, or rather, three attorneys, believing he would be more successful on appeal with this new team. She told him she wanted to help him because she knew her Aunt Rosa had conspired against him to achieve his conviction. Daniel had told me about this during many conversations, but I want to play you a clip of him explaining why, if Rosa really did have a part in withholding evidence from the defense, it's such a big deal to his case. To give you context, we started this conversation with me asking if he had ever reached out to Tony while incarcerated. So that's all. He, I mean, you haven't talked to him any after that. Nope. Nope. Except one time, like I said, when I made the phone call, I got his number. I asked if anybody, if anybody get in touch with him. How did y'all get in touch with him? 
I said, yeah, Danny, here's his number. Here, I can get in touch with him. I'll call him. I said, hey. I said, is this Tony Plant? He said, yeah. I said, I'm Daniel Plant. He said, okay, what? I said, I got evidence. He can get you out of prison. The only way he's going to get this evidence is you give me something. I can go back to court on to get me uh, a, new, uh, a new hearing. I said, I believe your brother done it. I just need proof of it. I said, you got that proof. So what's the evidence that you have that would help, Tony? That same evidence that uh, was Rosa Davis withheld evidence about the child molesting. Oh, that she okay. told Sarah. That she told Sarah. I was wondering how you knew that. So Sarah told you that, that Rosa knew. Yeah. Yeah. But, but how do you think that I, would help you in your case? Like, okay, because they withheld evidence. They would, you cannot withhold any kind of evidence in a, in a, in a case. Then you have to turn over every evidence you got, whether it's good or bad. You have to turn that over. If you hold with, if you hold any kind of evidence, that's a jurisdiction issue. Okay, that gets you back in court. All right. Whether that evidence affected the case, would it have a different outcome on the case? If it did, I had to give you a trial. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. I was thinking that you just thought that if everybody knew it was a child no. molester, then that would help your case, but I see what no, you're saying. No, 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 no. I didn't want to bring that up. I did not. I kept that to myself. Uh, they, they asked me. But when you agree to them ask me, Danny, just get this and get this out of the public. I said, no. I said, no. What he done, he done. It's over with. And he cannot change. I said, I'm, I got enough respect for this man, enough love for this man, not to jeopardize, not to destroy his name. I said, I'm not fixing to do that. That's why that never got brought up in court. That's what you're saying. Okay. And that's why... That's why one of the reasons why Sarah got so pissed off at me. Because she was just going to go, even though I believe the theory y'all come up with, I believe that to the chief, even though she was just going to put her aunt on the stand to testify to that, I wasn't just going to put her and her aunt on, you know, make them go head to head with each other. I wasn't just going to do all that. And that's why I believe we and them got pissed off at me. I'm not fishing uh, my fr I love my freedom. I want my freedom. But I'm not fishing put people lives that's gonna have a it's gonna affect them in the long term that they can't heal from. I'm not fishing to do that. I'm not that type of person. So no. you like your freedom but not at that price. No. Not no, not at that price. I can't just like, you know, I, I just can't hold myself to that thing, but I can't, I, you know, I respect God too much, God pays too much for our life, our freedom, I'm not, I'm not I, I can't, I could have been out, I know I could have been out, I could have been out 18 years ago, but at what cost? So you wouldn't pay that cost now to go home and be with your new family? But I thought about it, and part of me wants to say yes. A big part of me is overwhelmed because I'm tired. I'm tired of prison. I've been here 22 years, so I'm just tired. So I pray, I pray to God that doesn't come up. That's why I'm trusting God. I did this right now, Miss I told God, you know. God, this is my last one. This is it. This is it. Whatever happens, happens. I'm here for the rest of my life, too. I'm going to come. A lot of things I've been letting go for these 22 years, I'm not thinking I'm not thinking about letting go of that thing. I'm not. Because I'm tired, John. I'm tired of prison. I'm tired of being here for something I didn't do. I said, my time's good. It's good. I, I'm sorry to leave. This is how I thought we were. But he understands it, you know, but I'm not saying he's talking to you. 
this is why a lot of stuff is happening, I believe, because I'm real with God. I don't have my feelings with God. God already knows us. So I, I put everything on the table with God. And he's blessed with me. He really does. I talk to him like I talk to you. Like I talk to anybody. Daniel had told me the stories about Sarah, her connection to Rosa, Rosa's involvement in the court, working with Greg Biggs, and all this stuff that was truly like listening to a Lemony Snicket story. To me, all these stories had to be gigantic embellishments in Daniel's mind because I didn't have any evidence to support it, and it seemed pretty far-fetched. But one day recently, I got a call from a number in Mississippi that I didn't recognize. I had quickly run out of the house, taking only my car keys and phone, so I didn't have my recording device with me. It was a call from Daniel's mom, Debbie, and his sister, Lisa. They wanted to talk to me about Daniel's case and give me some information that I had not mentioned in the podcast. Although I didn't have my recorder with me, I scribbled some notes on a napkin as Debbie spoke. She mentioned Sarah and Rosa, just as Daniel had done, and said she could tell me all about it because she had been at the trial and all hearings since then. She said all I had to do was read the transcripts on one of the Rule 32 hearings where she said Rosa admitted in court that she had withheld evidence. I don't know why I had overlooked this information the entire time, but when I looked back at the many pages of trial transcripts, there it was, or at least part of what Debbie said. During Daniel's second appeal hearing, one of his new attorneys, Talitha Bailey, told the judge, quote, We also expect the evidence to show that the state had in its possession certain exculpatory evidence, specifically that the victim in this case was a child molester. Bailey went on to explain to Judge Rochester that had this information been made available to the defense, it would have given them grounds to offer the jury either reasonable alternative theories as to other suspects or possible mitigating circumstances which would have led to a lesser included offense. In correspondence from Wendy Reese, another member of Daniel's new team of attorneys, to Assistant Attorney General William Dill, Reese provides Dill with information he had requested for the upcoming appellate hearing dated August 1, 2001, including the witness list for that hearing. On the list is Sarah Hamlet, Daniel's former lover and niece of Rosa Davis, who was expected to testify that Rosa was aware of information that pinned Michael Bernas as having raped and molested boys and that said information was withheld from the defense. All this time, I didn't have proof that Michael Bernas had been accused of molestation, but it turned out that I had been overlooking the transcripts from this hearing that showed Daniel had mentioned this to someone else long before I had read it in an online petition, all the way back in 2001, only a few years after his conviction. I read over the transcripts with anticipation, hoping to see the arguments presented before the court, But Judge Rochester didn't allow this evidence to be admitted. It was never argued, although Talitha Bailey does bring it up briefly. And immediately after she does, William Deal requests an off-the-record discussion with Judge Rochester. If you aren't familiar with trial transcripts, they basically show what's allowed on record, so the court reporter will just put in parentheses something like off-the-record discussion, and then start back wherever the legal record begins again. When this discussion starts back, Judge Rochester is ready to continue on with the proceedings, but Talitha Bailey requests to invoke Rule 615 of the Alabama Rules of Evidence. This rule requires anyone acting as a witness or anyone in the court by way of subpoena leave the courtroom during the proceedings. When Judge Rochester asks these witnesses to leave the court, a familiar name speaks up and requests to be excluded from the rule. Rosa Davis. Rosa said that because she's an attorney, she hoped to be exempt from the rule, but Bailey argues that she's not exempt because if they are allowed to present evidence of the molestation allegations before Daniel's trial, she's a witness to that issue. The discussion between Rosa, Rochester, Dill, and Bailey goes on for several pages, with Talitha trying her best to have Rosa kept out of the courtroom, but Rochester allows her to stay after suggesting she be appointed as the Bernas family's designee which is essentially a loophole for allowing her to stay. With Rosa in the courtroom, Talitha Bailey presents evidence of perjury on the part of Richard Edge, an ineffective assistance of counsel from Daniel's original attorneys at trial because they failed to investigate Tony's claim that he had acted alone. It seemed great evidence to me, but I guess it wasn't, seeing as to how Rochester later ruled against Daniel. So I guess when I say I have evidence of wrongdoing, I really just have speculation. 
Rosa doesn't come out and say she has knowledge of molestation, but it's implied by others in the court. And there's a possibility she could have said something incriminating like Debbie had accused during the off-record discussion. I don't have a way of proving what Debbie said, but the speculation is there. The fact that Rosa and her co-worker, William Deal, fought so hard for her to stay in the courtroom is questionable to me. This information just really doesn't look good for her in my eyes. This is like when someone has a close connection or relationship to a case and they're in a position to be accused of wrongdoing, they generally recuse themselves. But not in this case. Rosa Davis, the Alabama Chief Assistant Attorney General, is present at the grand jury proceedings, present at the trial, and present at every hearing after trial, even once she's been accused of withholding evidence. Then, like in all facets of this case, Daniel's luck runs out when he has evidence to prove this speculation, but the judge doesn't allow it to be argued, and subsequently rules against him even with other evidence of wrongdoing on the part of the lead prosecutor. So is that it? Even after looking through and disproving much of the evidence presented at trial, and even more evidence presented after during his appellate hearings, is Daniel just stuck in prison? Are we just so set on his guilt that we aren't able to entertain the thought of him being innocent? And not just him, but Tony too? The only question I really have now is what I'm sure many of you are asking. Where do we go from here? next week on Skeptical. We're going to switch it up a bit for next week. Instead of our usual narrative, we're going to answer a few listener questions and dig deeper into some information we've previously discussed. We'll switch back to the narrative for our final 10th episode that will air September 4th. So don't forget to join us next week at 4 p.m. as we inch closer to our finale. We'll see y'all then. Skeptical is a production of Reckon Recordings. It is created, written, and narrated by me. Our senior producer is Chris Faulkner. Chantrice Martin is our editorial advisor. Original music provided by Rosalind Bergeau. If you like our podcast and want to support us, help us out by heading over to iTunes and leaving us a five-star review. You can also share our content with your friends, follow us on social media through our handle, SkepticalPod, and, most importantly, subscribe to our podcast. If you'd like to support us with a donation, check out our Patreon. We reward our patrons with exclusive bonus content, including extended audio interviews, photos, videos, and more. Just visit patreon.com slash skepticalpod to get started. You can find out more about us, our projects, and our mission by visiting us at reckonrecordings.com. That's R-E-C-K-O-N recordings.com. Don't forget to tune in every Tuesday for another installment of Skeptical. We'll see y'all then. Thank you.